so much for joining us for this session on Introduction to Casework. I'm Ann Meeker. I'm the Director of uh, Strategic Initiatives for the Popbox Foundation. More importantly for this session, two jobs and a pandemic ago, I was Director of Constituent Services for Congressman Seth Moulton. Casework is my favorite thing in the world to talk about. Um, I am so excited to be here with you today to, to talk you through the basics for what is casework? Um, how is it one of the ways that you can make the most tangible impact in the lives of your constituents? How can it be a springboard to, to understanding the rest of Congress as well? So where does casework fit in Congress's responsibilities? Where does it fit in your responsibilities as an intern, whether you're in the district office, whether you're in DC? Um, and then if we have some time at the end, I promise we will try to do some practice exercises on thinking like a caseworker. Um, so we have a small group today, so I'd love to uh, get some reactions from you. So please feel free to post any questions that you have in the chat at any time, and I'll be uh, happy to answer them. Uh, before we get started, did anyone, you can just throw it in the chat, who attended uh, Project on Gover Government Oversight session on Intro to Oversight, and who attended Dr. Brian Baird's session on Navigating Constituent Interactions? All right, well, that's that's your homework after this session. Uh, we are going to post all of these videos online. So those two other sessions, again, Intro to Oversight and Navigating Constituent Interactions are also really foundational for understanding casework. So definitely recommend uh, taking a second to go back and check those out. All right, so as I said, um, I my background here is as a caseworker. So I uh, did an internship in the district office of my local member of Congress uh, right after grad school. I started as an intern, did a fall internship uh, where I was kind of attached to one of the caseworkers in that office who handled kind of the miscellaneous bucket. So that caseworker handled constituent issues with Social Security, Medicare, the IRS, the Postal Service, Department of Labor everything else that wasn't one of the other big agencies. And I utterly fell in love with it. So I stayed at that office for several years. Um, I moved up, I was hired as a caseworker, uh, eventually moved up to senior caseworker and then director of constituent services where I ran the four person team responsible for casework. So just thinking about what is, what is casework overall and where does it fit into Congress's responsibilities? So if you're in the Schoolhouse Rock session, uh, a couple sessions back, uh, we heard uh, heard those speakers talking about uh, checks and balances in the setup of the American government. You've all seen this before. This is from your civics class. So we're over here in the legislative branch, and the legislative branch is responsible for overseeing uh, everything else that happens in these other two. So the judicial branch over there, they do their own thing, but then the big issue is this executive branch. So because of the administrative state, uh, executive branch is mostly tasked with carrying out Congress's intentions when it comes to legislation. So in a, in a couple of words, Congress's oversight role is partly making sure that all of these executive branch agencies do what Congress intended to carry out, uh, carry out and administer Congress's, Congress's wishes expressed through legislation. Um, I, oversight is also kind of road testing that, le that legislation. So understanding, all right, this legislation has been implemented. How does it actually impact constituents? How does it impact my constituents? What is their experience of that legislation as it's being carried out? And that's really where we get into casework. So like I said, so when we think about legislation and oversight, we tend to think about Schoolhouse Rock where the bill is introduced, the bill gets passed, the bill gets signed into law, uh, constituents are happy, the member of Congress is reelected, ta-da, everything's perfect, but that's really not where, where the story ends. So like we said, so Congress uh, introduces that legislation, eventually gets passed, it gets handed to the executive branch to implement. Uh, and then the constituents experience of that, of that legislation should come back to Congress who will then keep this cycle going uh, to, to make any changes that are necessary. So for just a quick example, because uh, this is one of my favorite parts of my former portfolio, uh, Social Security. So the very potted history of how Social Security came to be um, in the Depression, it became uh, very clear that there needed to be some kind of extra support for people who are uh, no longer or never able to support themselves through work. FDR comes into office, says this is a big priority of my administration. Uh, convenes a big committee, a committee on economic security that did a detailed study of existing programs in other countries and then at the state and local level that eventually led to a legislative proposal. The law got introduced, it got uh, debated in committees, it got amended, all that good stuff. It got signed into law August of 1935. And so then the problem was how do we implement it? So Social Security as it was passed looked a lot like we think about it today. So the uh, so as an employee, portion of your wages get withheld from your paycheck and your payroll taxes. That gets paid into Social Security's trust fund, where when you reach retirement, that gets paid out to you according to a formula based on how much you earned and how much you worked. So 
already just from the process of getting set up there, you can imagine a couple of easy points of failure. First of all, everyone needed a social security number. If your application for a social security number got lost, what do you do? Uh, what do you do when the cost of living increases between when you're working and when you plan to retire? Uh, what happens if your application for benefits goes missing or there's misinformation on it? So there's a lot, uh, a lot that could go wrong. And you had better believe that members of Congress at the time heard about all of those problems from their constituents. And the same is still true today. So what does that actually sound like? So you're an intern, you're on a phone shift, you pick up the phone, what do you hear that makes your brain go, this might be a case, this might be something that sounds like casework. So this is the kind of thing that's gonna, that these are the kinds of things you might hear on the phone that's alerting you that something might be wrong with a constituent's experience of a federal agency. You might hear something like, hey, I sent in, agency keeps asking me for this document, I've sent it in four times, what's going on? Or, you know, I've been denied and I really don't think that I should be denied for this benefit. Or, can you help me? I've been trying to get on the phone with social security for the last, uh, you know, 58 days and I'm just not getting anywhere. I don't know what to do. Um, so those are all things that start to, should start to kind of trigger that little casework, casework wheel going in your brain. So what actually is casework? So the words that I used to use to describe it to constituents when they called me, when I got one of those phone calls and said, hey, Ann, I'm having trouble with social security. What can Congressman Moulton do to help me? Um, in a very broad sense, caseworkers are advocates for their constituents. They're not advocates for specific constituents in a certain way. They're advocates for all of the constituents in that member's district. Um, so it, that's important to keep in mind. We'll get to what casework isn't in a minute, um, but you have to keep in mind you're advocating for everybody so you can't privilege certain people above other people. In a lot of ways, it's translation and it's education work. So I'd be saying this constituent comes to me and say, I don't understand this letter. So I've handled this letter. I've seen 500 copies of this letter before. So I know what that letter is trying to say. So I might, and I know my district. So I might be able to explain to that constituent better. Hey, this is actually what this letter is telling you. And now here are your options going forward. It's also education about benefits and programs that constituents might not know about. Making sure that the federal government is doing the right outreach work to tell people in an equitable and a fair way about what's available to them. On that lane as well, it's also identifying options is one of the biggest points. So if someone comes to me and they say, hey, Social Security uh, denied my application for disability benefits. This is wrong. I want Congressman Moulton to fix it. I'd say, well, you know, I, I, I completely sympathize with your situation. This does seem like a funny case. So here are your options from here. You have these two or these three different types of appeals. Here's what each of them does. Now make that decision for yourself and I will be here to assist once you've actually made the next step. And to be really clear, sometimes it doesn't, it's not working with federal benefits. Sometimes it's not working with federal agencies, but it's connecting those constituents to other resources in your community that you know about as a caseworker that they may not. And then just to be really clear, there's a whole bunch of people that you can do casework for. And sometimes that's where they get really fun that you do constituents for individuals that also do them for businesses. Um, I worked a really fun case for a local sailing club, a nonprofit sailing club uh, that was having trouble with their tax status. So you can really have some fun there. Before we go any further, this is what your caseworkers want you to know that they can't do. Um, the rule of congressional courtesy dictates members of Congress use their resources for their constituents and their constituents only, and that they kind of get first day, first crack of the apple uh, when one of their constituents is having a problem. So if someone calls you, oh my God, I need Congressman Moulton's help. Okay, sir, I need to know where you live. Idaho. Well, let me connect you to your Idaho rep. And if you explain the situation to me, I'll make sure that they know what you're looking for. We'll get you connected. So it, first thing you want to find out is, is someone in your district, are they actually a constituent? Second thing is a federal agency. So state agencies and local agencies are handled by your state representatives, your state senators, your local elected officials. Most of what you're going to be able to work with is a federal agency. You might, there might be some tangential and there might be some edge cases, edge cases and some overlap, uh, but for the most part, you need to figure out if the constituent is calling about a federal agency. Similarly, you can't ask for exceptions. We talked about this a little bit with advocacy. You cannot uh, in one way privilege a constituent over another constituent. So if I have two constituents who've both been denied for the same benefit, I have to tell them both the same thing. I can't say, well, hey, Social Security, can you try to just make an exception for Mrs. Jones? Eh, Mr. Jones, eh, I don't know, maybe he doesn't deserve it. Like you don't wanna get into the position of making those judgment calls. What, what I used to tell constituents is I am here to make sure the law is fair to everybody, not to ask for an exception to the law for anybody. Um, so keep that in mind. Similarly, I'm not a lawyer. 
I have no idea about legal advice. So keep in mind, neither are you. Uh, even if you're in law school, you are an attorney coming back for a second career. Um, I used to know an attorney who was a former caseworker who told constituents, I am a lawyer, I am not your lawyer. So you can never be in a position of telling a constituent what to do. You're there to assist as they make their own decisions. Um, the last big one is fraud. You'd be surprised. People come to their members of Congress asking for help committing fraud. I had a couple of these cases and it always just blew my mind. It does happen. Just keep an eye out. And if your spidey senses start tingling that something is wrong, tell one of the caseworkers, one of the staffers you're working about, because you may be right. Okay, so now that we've gone through a little bit of what casework is, what can casework achieve? This is really the fun part. Um, what you can achieve with through casework for your constituents is really tangible. Um, so these two quotes up on the screen are, are two constituents that I, I did personally work with. Um, there might be a moment as a caseworker when you help a constituent uh, get a benefit through that had been delayed for years and you get to call that constituent and say, hey, there's a $76,000 retroactive check heading your way. Um, and there's, that's an amazing, an amazing feeling, let me tell you. That is a highlight. Um, but you also might be get to say, hey, your son is going to have health care again, like your son's disability benefits are turned back on, or your father gets the recognition for his service in Vietnam that he was denied when he came home for a host of bureaucratic reasons. So there, there are really tangible things that you can do here and intangible ones too. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so how does it all work? Okay, so you're a constituent, you're answering the mail for your member, you get this letter. Dear representative, I need your help with social security. I'm disabled. Uh, I used to get a pension, but I don't get it anymore. Social security thinks I still get it. So they're denying my disability. I've submitted all my documentation. Uh, I'm gonna be evicted if I can't get it sorted out before the next month, please help me. So what, as your casework team, what are you going to do to help that constituent? All right, written very large. And I want you to please ignore some of the, the, the times on here. This is from my old office. Your office may do things differently. Uh, but this is the casework process writ large. So the, uh, so the constituent calls, calls, faxes, emails, whatever, comes to you, says, I have a problem. Your team determines this sounds like casework. They get a Privacy Act release form to that constituent. That's the magic form that lets you do casework on that constituent's behalf. And then your, uh, your, your caseworker figures out what other documentation they need, gathers it all up, and sends uh, an inquiry to that agency. So going back, oops, sorry, I know this is dizzy. Um, so going back to this big uh, diagram of the federal government, each of these executive branch agencies should have a congressional liaison. So that's the person assigned to be the point of contact with Congress. Sometimes they have more than one, sometimes they have different ones for different areas or different uh, case types. It gets complicated, but fundamentally, your caseworker has someone that they can call, that they can uh, write to, to say, hey, this constituent is having this problem. Here's the case as I understand it. Can you please tell me what's going on? So that's where it all starts to come together. So that agency might say, hey, great. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. We're so sorry. It seems like it was a bureaucratic snafu on our end. We've corrected that in our system. This constituent's problem is solved. Carry on. Or they might say, hey, you know, thanks for bringing this to our attention. We actually still need more documentation from this constituent. They have to file this. Uh, and then that caseworker will work with that constituent to get all those other pieces and get them back to the agency and try to uh, try to expedite from there. So one way or another, eventually the case is going to resolve. Hopefully it's favorably. Sometimes it's not. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and then that case will close out. Caseworker will say, thank you so much for the chance to serve you, Mrs. Jones. Anything else we can do? No, thank you. We're here if you need us in the future. So that's what it should look like. Sometimes I'm going to be real with you. It looks like this. <laughs> so this is a real case that actually had one of my interns journey map out for me. Um, uh, and I, it goes on above the screen, it goes on below the screen and the case wasn't even over uh, when, when the intern did this journey map. So it's um, sometimes casework can be really complicated and it can last a really long time. So your office probably has a list of, kind of the longest cases or the frequent callers. Um, so getting to know some of them and knowing a little bit about their case background will also kind of help you help you get the context you need to jump in. So, and there's a lot of creativity that happens in a long case like this too. So it's not just congressional liaison, constituent liaison, constituent. Sometimes it's the constituent is having another problem in the meantime. So how are you going to bring in a different agency or a different way to solve that constituent's problem? And it's a lot of emotional management too. Um, again, this backs to what doc, gets back to what Dr. Baird was talking about earlier with 
how can you, if this constituent is having a real problem, people don't call their member of Congress because they're having a great day. So how can you make that constituent feel seen, understood, valued, even as they're uh, in the midst of this, of this emergency, this crisis with, with the government? So like I said, so thinking about your role, whether you're in the district, whether you're in DC, you have a couple of really important jobs to help your casework team. Uh, the biggest thing, like we said, is making that constituent feel heard, understood, appreciated, your basic customer service, constituent service skills. You're also demonstrating competence and professionalism. Constituents coming to you because the agents, federal agency has made a mistake. You want to right off the bat, just radiate professionalism and competence. You want that constituent to feel like, whew, I'm in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing and is going to solve this. You're also helping with traffic control. Most of your caseworkers will probably have a portfolio that's bigger than they really have time for. So you're gonna help manage the flow of constituents to them. So talk to your, talk to your caseworkers about just when to pass on a phone call, when to take a message, make sure you know what their expectations are. You're also helping with data integrity. So if you talk to a constituent caseworker can't, um, you need to take great notes so that caseworker has all of that information. If a constituent says, well, I talked to, Anne in your office, and she said you were going to have it fixed by Thursday. Um, I need to know if that's the constituent's expectation. And also don't make promises like that unless you know that's what's going to happen. And then you can assist in the move the ball forward work. For that, let me, I'm going to share a really quick video. I'll kind of get you a sense for how does casework turn into legislation that ultimately eliminates the need for casework. It's always the dream. Okay, hopefully you'll be able to figure this out. Dear Jonathan Reynoso, we have met your requirements for compensation and pension. Payment was not approved from the date that we received on the exclusion one instruction of ICD 214352 is received K5 16 dot what? <laughs> <laughs> People who have to go to the government for help shouldn't be tied up in useless government bureaucracy lost in confusing letters they can barely understand. The government should be able to help people, to help people get their social security and Medicare benefits, to help people get the money they deserve from the VA. The treatment that I needed to continue was delayed because I didn't know what next steps to take. It's time we simplify the process for dealing with government agencies. There is a number listed on this page in which I called that number and spoke to a woman who told me she read the letter and did not understand it. Think about when you get your credit card bill. Everything you need to do is right up top. You can read below for detail, but you know what to do right up front. Shouldn't government paperwork be the same? It's too long, didn't read. Have been coded that should not be reported together based on the excludes one instructions in ICD-10. However, if both conditions are present, unrelated, and documented. So there's, so there's just a really quick example for what casework can lead to. So you're not only doing the, you're not only helping constituents get back, maybe it's money, maybe it's time, maybe you're rebuilding their trust in government, maybe you're helping solve a problem that's been weighing on them for so long, but you're also helping them understand that, that civic engagement does lead to change. So even if you can't solve uh, a case in the way that you'd like to for your constituents, showing them that, hey, you're, you're suffering, your problem here wasn't in vain. It's gonna help us uh, really make a change that'll help people before, that'll help people after you can be so valuable. So no, I am out of time really quickly. Uh, my top five for impressing your casework team. Um, welcome every constituent with dignity and in good faith. Assume the best of everybody when they walk into your door. Know your team's process. Have good judgment, you're there for compassion, but you can't go too far in helping a constituent if it's gonna be at the expense of other people. Uh, be creative in finding solutions and then take good care of yourself because this is not always easy. Thanks everybody.